And we are live. It says, this Google Hangout is live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our little corner of the web, coolsinaustralia.com. And welcome to Sandy. Sandy, how are you going today? It's great, and I'm thrilled to be here. That's all right. And people that are watching, what you'll see is when Sandy talks, you don't see Sandy, but you see her presentation. So what we're going to do in this webinar um, is Sandy's going to present live, actually. She's going to show you her slides live and talk to them for about 25 to 30 minutes. And as she's doing that, if you notice underneath the webinar, you'll see uh, there's a Facebook comments section. If you've got questions and comments as she speaks, please just post them up there. And then we'll come back and we'll have a discussion for another half an hour. Does that sound good for you, Sandy? It's great. I'm ready. Awesome. You were born ready. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> so every, anybody who's got questions as Sandy speaks, please just um, log them in underneath the, 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 the video that you're viewing now. And uh, without further ado, it's over to you, Sandy. Take it away. Thank you, Carl. Uh, it's exciting, but... This isn't rolling. Let's see if we can get it rolling now. Whoops, it was. There we go. Well, I'd like to speak to you tonight about, or today for you over there, it's tonight in Colorado, the tongue and how it affects the body. I've spent so much time working on the tongue. It's amazing um, that <laughs> so few people really understand what it does. So I thought I would just share some things with you. Um, a photo of the tongue, which you're all aware, certainly looking at the frenulum, the hyoid, and the papilla, but I thought you might like to look at the lower surface of the tongue as well. And this is one area that I think we need to really be concerned about to um, address when we are making referrals for some of our patients who are needing lingual phrenectomies, it is so important that we refer to people who really understand this part of the tongue and the mechanism of how all of this works beneath the tongue so that we are getting the proper amount of res uh, resecting and I know that there are some doctors who really do understand this. I simply could not resist putting this in. I found this on the web. I've never seen anything like it. Um, I'm not certain that it's been photoshopped. It looks quite real to me, judging by the teeth. So I don't doubt that someone had the... Um, dissensibility to do something like this, but if you look at the uh, piercing on the lip, I rather imagine it might be quite um, real, but if not, I thought it was interesting anyway. So I want to talk a little about some of the things that I see. Geographic tongue, of course, low tongue posture, which all of you are well aware anterior rest posture, certainly helping to hold open and create open bites like this, a bilateral rest posture, just had one this afternoon where none of those teeth met at all going from molar to molar. So then if we look at unilateral posterior uh, rest patterns and swallowing patterns, um, I talk with so many dentists who really don't understand that the tongue really helps to create that. And from that, we certainly, of course, see a lot of our little kiddos with Down syndrome. But I want to show you what's possible when we get that tongue up just in three weeks' time. It's not perfect yet, but you can see what a change there is in this little guy's face. So I want um, just to reiterate that the tongue is not just another muscle. The concept that it could be considered an organ 
rather than just another muscle affecting a lot of body systems is somewhat foreign to a lot of people in the dental and medical communities. Um, certainly it becomes obvious as we all work, those of us in these sorts of fields with these systems and begin to recognize how much the interaction is and how important it really is. Um, certainly you are well aware that tongue is a muscular organ um, covered with tiny papillae. The taste buds are a collection of nerve cells. That's why we taste things and why I love chocolate so much. The tongue is anchored in the mouth by webs of tough tissue, fascia, and by the way, at the end of this presentation, I've included a really nice um, segment, which we're not going to necessarily discuss on fascia. I found this a while back, thought it might be interesting for you. Anyway, the tongue is certainly vital for chewing and swallowing food, as well as speech and maxillary arch width and facial development. Since um, we use our mouths 24 hours per day, what our tongue does, where it rests, how it functions, will certainly affect our speaking, our occlusion, our TM joints, our head, neck, and body posture, and even our hips, knees, and feet. And if you speak with osteopaths who are looking at this sort of functionality, you will hear them say that they do see that the tongue plays an important role. Macroglossia, you are well aware of, certainly congenital, inflammatory, traumatic cancer and metabolic causes, thyroid disease, I'm seeing more lymphangiomas and congenital abnormalities as being some of the causes for these enormous tongues. Um, a swollen tongue, I just saw a patient a couple of days ago with a tongue that was so much bigger than I think I'd ever seen before. No one had really um, diagnosed, looked at, tried to discern why this child's tongue was huge. I'm certain they have Beckwith Wiedemann syndrome, which can also lead to many other issues with enlarged organs in the body. And an overactive thyroid, hypothyroidism, leukemia, strep throat, and anemia, many different kinds of anemias as well. And neuralgia can be a source of tongue pain. Severe pain along the cranial nerve number seven, hypoglossal nerve, um, often results from aging, MS, diabetes, tumors, or it can be of no obvious origin. I had to put this in, the cat got your tongue, how often do you hear that? It originated at least 2,500 years ago in Assyria where the conquered soldiers and criminals had their tongues cut out and fed to the cats. So that's, has the cat got your tongue? Now, because it becomes um, different shapes for all of us and a very number of taste buds, what we know is that the human tongue is as great an imprint as our fingerprint. And if you've studied much about the tongue, you also realize that the tongue can be left and right-sided, much like our body, but not related to our handedness. I'm looking so much at the maxilla. Um, as it creates the entire face, extending far up into the eye sockets in the face. You can also see that the size and shape and the position will touch everything from the nose, the eyes, the tooth alignment, um, cheekbones, and even then change and reposition that of the lower jaw. When you look at the significance of this one bone, it's amazing that people are often only concerned with the teeth and their crowding and forget about the tongue. There, good view of the maxilla and that arch and how important it is as it really builds the face. 
So complimentary from Dr. John Mew and his orthotropics, you can read all of these changes that happen when the tongue's position is lowered. Look what happens in illustration number five where the arch width of the lower teeth really becomes much more narrow. So when the tongue is resting low in the mouth, we are going to expect quite a different facial appearance. Facial symmetry is certainly showing the contours, forward and side carriage of the head, facial tension, premature lining. I get a lot of patients coming in who are concerned about how their faces are lining. And when I look at their occlusion and the way their, their um, teeth actually fit, it's amazing how many of these people have actually lived with these sorts of things for a long time and they begin to show up as people age in the lining of the face. Certainly I see more open mouth rest posture than most anything and that does certainly produce a lot of premature lining. So I'll show you a few photographs here, Bell's palsy, certainly uh, something that oral myology deals quite a lot with and I've just started with this gal. I think we're going to have some pretty incredible results with her. Then this is a little cookie that I met at 18 months. She had had a tumor in her left maxilla and you can see that it almost looks as if she had a cleft palate surgery, which it did turn out to be. In a short time here, five years, here is our little girl. You can see, however, that her eye height is not the same. Her nostrils are not the same. I've been to four surgeries with this little gal, and there will be many more because she is missing her entire maxillary arch on the left side. But we've been fortunate to find a fabulous prosthodontist here in Denver who has had some creative ideas about how to actually keep her in pretty good form. And she and I work together um, and we've worked together since she was 18 months. She has perfect speech. Her Chewing and swallowing is quite good. She has a prosthetic device now, which is being changed about every six months because of her growth pattern. So here's another one with a long left ramus. I'm certain that many of you have seen this. Um, working to get stability for one thing, getting the lips closed, and then getting the tongue into a good position is certainly helpful. Again here, retronathic jaw, certainly a happier patient on the right when we can see a chin looking at the hyoid muscles actually working for her. Look at her smile line, how much straighter it is as well if the tongue is up. A forward tongue posture certainly creating an open bite with a quite long narrow face developing and with good tongue posture still in orthodontic appliances but facial shape changing quite a lot and here's one that is quite obvious you can see that tongue actually resting forward propped right in between those anterior teeth and with better tongue posture and certainly a lot of facial muscle activity and exercise. You see what a lovely smile line she has now. Another retronathic jawline, certainly orthodontics moving through there and you can see what a nice facial profile she's developing here. And we see many of these class three malocclusions what do you think created that lower arch to rest forward? I see it all the time when there is a low forward tongue posture. So studies published uh, recently have shown that chewing-like activities such as biting, clenching, and bruxing really are regulating 
bone growth, development and maintenance of occlusion, reducing the stress, often increasing the attention span. I have a lot of my patients chewing gum before they do final exams and things to actually increase their cognition and stabilize their TM joints. Now, we don't do a lot of gum chewing with TM joint patients, but chewing properly makes a huge difference. And certainly if they're chewing well, we get better absorption of foods and the utilization of those calories much more efficiently. The tongue for years when infants were born was checked immediately at birth. I know you've probably all heard the old wives tale that the midwives had a long fingernail that was used to clip the frenulum of an infant who could not immediately nurse. I'm not certain that's true. I've heard um, that it's true and possibly false, but it's a great story. I've used it quite a bit because it does make some sense. There has to be somebody looking at this. And if it's not those of us who are interested in this, like oral myologists, lactation consultants, dental nurses, dental hygienists, um, certainly oral surgeons, but a lot of these are missed. I'm getting many more referrals from lactation consultants who have now been trained to evaluate the tongue and refer and provide appropriate treatment. So certainly when there is an abnormal function of the tongue, there are many areas of the body that are affected. Tethered tongue or tongue tie affects the person's ability to lift the tongue for a proper placement to achieve correct rest posture and a proper swallow. But it also makes a huge difference in their chewing. I have a little guy who's just not been able to chew on his left side at all, and his tongue is absolutely tied tighter than almost any I've seen. And the parents from India have been just perplexed. They've had him to every feeding specialist in this community, and no one has addressed the fact that this little guy was tongue-tied. So, of course, I've sent him off to get that dealt with, and he's going to have an entirely different life. So the tethered tongue also stops the pressure of the tongue upward. You know, I'm married to an orthodontist who feels quite strongly that the tongue helps to certainly develop the arch and create a functional occlusion. So you've seen these kinds of examples of tethered tongues. Um, it's amazing how many I'm seeing in infants uh, right down to one, two, and three week olds. But... I'm not having very many people talk about posterior tongue tie. This is one of the most dramatic I've ever seen. She is a current patient of mine. She is going soon to have that dealt with, and she and her mother have exactly the same sort of tongue that they can actually have contests about who can make more waves with those muscles of the tongue than the other. They have quite a lot of fun doing it, but in reality it's really impacted both of their speech patterns. So TOTS, the tethered oral tissues in an infant's tongue and the upper lip attachment and also the buccal attachments make such a difference in breastfeeding. So we're looking at all of these things that are impacted by the fact that the tongue may not be working properly. Um, when, I'm sorry, when an infant is tongue tied, the restriction may cause it to rest back in the airway, interfering and reducing the flow of oxygen to the brain, and certainly interfering with normal neuro neurologic growth and development. I have an infant in the hospital right now that I've been arguing with the pediatricians and the ENTs about the fact that this child is tongue tied 
they simply do not understand how much of an impact it will make when they are able to actually have that released. Fortunately, I have a colleague who is a pediatric dentist at our children's hospital here in Denver who is actually going to release this infant who was six months old and has spent six months in the NICU in our hospital here in Denver. And all I needed to do was to move his little mandible forward and watch his nostrils open and his breathing pattern completely change. So uh, I think we're going to get this dealt with this week. Poor tongue posture and an open mouth rest posture can certainly exacerbate tonsil and adenoid issues by not using the nose, creating all sorts of sinus issues. Many people with these issues, of course, have a forward hip posture and they wind up with neck and shoulder pain. You can't really look at a patient and determine, usually, whether they have a deviated nasal septum. This is um, certainly that thin wall of bone and cartilage which separates your passages is situated right in the center of your nose. And one would expect that if it was deviated, you might be able to see it. But it's not true. I send patients frequently to be evaluated and the diagnosis comes back that the septum is deviated. And then once that's repaired often will find a big change in their obstructed breathing and snoring and certainly their low tongue posture which when the posture is low it affects the head neck and shoulders and as I said earlier every single muscle down to their toes. The reduction in oxygen has such a potential to affect the cardiovascular and respiratory system when the tie is ignored and left untreated as the infant matures, certainly we see changes in skeletal and orofacial development. It certainly contributes to speech difficulties. I cannot tell you how many speech pathologists have referred cases to me which they felt they could not correct and it seemed like they had never looked in the mouth and under the tongue. When we evaluate and get those issues dealt with, it's amazing what changes happen in these children and their speech patterns. So the sinuses you're probably aware of that there are two sinus cavities in the forehead, two behind each cheekbone, two within the bones between your eyes, and two behind each eye. However, sinus blockages um, certainly can happen a lot even though it doesn't seem to a lot of ENTs that this is one of the major issues. I was unaware until I started doing some research on this about an extra sinus that about 10% of people do have. It effectively narrows that transition space called the ostium and if you read some of the um, papers that Dr. Albritton has written, you'll find that he really delves into this extra sinus issue and that certainly impedes the breathing. I have to share this one, actually it's been put in upside down here, but I want to show you in the illustration on the lower right you can see that the tongue is resting low. This is a lateral cephalometric head film made on an eye cat. You can see that the tongue is down. You can see the roof of the mouth. You can see the tongue has backed up into the pharynx. And if you look at the nasal passages, they're quite blocked. Now, we worked for eight weeks and this is where we actually wound up. You'll see that as we elevated the tongue into the palate, we completely opened the airway. As you look at the coronal view, you can see how much space has increased and the breathing capacity and the snoring has totally stopped. 
This took eight sessions, and this has been five years ago now. And this patient, whom I see somewhat regularly because she works for a company with whom I work quite often, and she is still not snoring, nor is she having any breathing issues. So um, there are several things being written now about how orofacial myofunctional therapy is beneficial for snoring and sleep apnea. I want to share this guy with you, an extreme case, developed an excessively narrow maxillary arch, certainly from a tethered tongue not dealt with, sinus issues, small nasal passages, and you can imagine how it had affected his self-esteem having few friends and not participating in many of the things that he was could have been involved in in school. So here is his open bite. Um, certainly the lower arch doesn't look bad, but my word, look at his maxilla. So these are the kinds of things that tongues can affect. As well here, speech and articulation are major issues for so many of the people that we see. Besides not being able to properly produce a lot of the sounds which you see on the screen, you would see um, and hear from parents that they are frustrated that their kids mumble. They simply cannot understand them. So looking at body posture, we've all seen these sorts of things. Of course we want that middle posture to be what we're accomplishing as we work toward better tongue posture, better breathing as well, so that we are getting these people to be healthier overall. I put this in because I thought Sterecta was kind of a, an interesting um, phenomenon. This fellow did quite a lot to strengthen and straighten his own spine. So if you choose to go into that site, I think you'll be quite interested in what kinds of things he did that actually did straighten his spine. In looking for other things that tongues might well do, knock knees came up, and I do see many knock knees in a lot of patients who are open mouth breathers. I'm sure if we talk much with our osteopathic friends, they would agree, but um, a lot of people think there is no problem. However, most of the patients I see who stand and walk like this have a narrow maxillary arch, a forward head posture, and they seem to fall more often. If you look at her stance as well, her left shoulder is very much lower than her right as well. And of course, she's going to wear five inch heels so that she can just fall more often. So um, I'll address just quickly cervical dystonia, uh, spasmodic torticollis, mainly because I saw an infant last week who was um, quite a difficult birth and certainly has torticollis. And, just is unable at four weeks to turn her little head central. So I've sent her to some occupational therapy and also um, she's going to have a phrenectomy as well because these things seem to somewhat go together. Um, certainly dystonia can be a rare disorder at any age, even in infancy. Um, I have to say that my cervical dystonia, which affects my voice and also affects my head tremor, was caused by an auto accident in 2009. So I'm quite familiar with cervical dystonia, which kind of comes on top of my essential tremor, which those two together are not exactly positive. There is no cure for cervical dystonia, which I've discovered. However, some of the neurologists are injecting botulism toxins, which many of you might remember that a year and a half ago when I taught a course in Sydney, I came with my head supported by a neck brace because 
The neurologist had injected far too much toxin, and I had head drop. So uh, surgery, surgery may be appropriate, but I've really not talked to anybody who's done anything like that. And the botulism, if it's not administered in correct dosages, makes a huge difference. But you can imagine that it does cause difficulty with the tongue posture when there is head drop. And I have to say, it changed my speech quite a lot. I had to work very hard when I was wearing that neck brace to become proficient in my speech. Uh, the tongue does affect many areas of the body. It's important to look at the rest of the body and cooperate with as many professionals as possible to help our patients achieve optimum health. Um, breathing, certainly it affects a low tongue posture, affects breathing 24-7. I know that most people are calling it sleep disordered breathing. However, there's a huge movement to change that terminology to breathing disordered sleep. I am a strong proponent of that. The tongue certainly plays a huge role in the person's ability to breathe nasally. And the function for release of carbon dioxide is truly only achieved by having a good tongue posture with lips closed and the person being able to breathe through their nose. I did address breathing and sleep in my last webinar. If you have not seen that, please check it out. And I have supported what I've stated tonight with many references. Please feel free to look at those. And I thank you very much for tuning in. Ah, and now we get to see your face as well, Sandy. <laughs> Hello. Looking amazing as always. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for that presentation. It was, um, I mean, like I've got a list of questions down here. Uh, we've got some people watching. I just wonder if anyone who's been watching that has some questions, just pop them in, in the Facebook feed underneath the video and um, Sandy will answer them live on air. Is, uh, has anyone got anything? Oh, Colleen says the screen's a little blurry. Apologise if that's the case. Um, you know what? Actually, Sandy, at the end, you were talking about cooperating with health professionals. And um, we actually have one of those amazing health professionals in our webinar room tonight. And I thought we might just bring her in for a couple of uh, pertinent comments. Now, what do you one think? One of my favorite friends, Colin, Marjan Jones. Dr. Dr. Marjan Jones. Dr. Marjan, Marjan Jones. I'm getting my pronunciation right. Everyone knows I've got an incompetent upper lip. <laughs> so, Dr. Jones, perhaps you can switch your microphone on and, um, and, and maybe just provide a little bit for people that are watching. We've, we've got um, a dozen people on. Provide a little bit about what you do. Um, I know you've done a lot of t work with tongue ties. Um, and so on, just provide a bit of a background and, and then sort of share that little piece that you were um, keen to talk about. That would be awesome. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are. Um, what a wonderful opportunity to, to get the ground set about the, the importance of tongue function for our optimum health. And Sandy's touched on these concentric circles beyond just the mouth and how this organ can affect our whole posture and well-being and breathing. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I work at a practice here in Brisbane, Australia, and we have the privilege of serving and assisting families that come from around our city, our state, our country, and beyond. We have um, regular uh, families flying in to see us, and it's our privilege to assist them on this journey because I think our outlook is very similar to how Sandy explained, is that we look at the fact that all or uh, uh, several professionals can as, um, assist to establish proper oral function and tongue, tongue function. 
Um, and so in, in aid of that, I thought I would just share a glimpse um, about, um, about what we do, but more importantly, encourage you to come to Sandy's course and then the day after where we can begin to share um, some of the insights that we have gained, particularly over the last four years where we've been intensely focusing on um, re-establishment of optimum oral function. Um, so yeah, so basically what I wanted to share is that our habits are set very early in life. Um, sometimes people uh, are thinking only about um, you know, adults or children, but really when we think about the very first important function that we have um, that uh, is breastfeeding. And as early as that, can these symptoms and signs um, be identified um, and that family and that child, that patient, um, go through a process of not having to deal with all the issues that come later in life. Um, and habits are much harder to change later in life. And so early identification, um, diagnosis and management, um, and management is more than just surgery, is more than just orofacial myology. Um, there, it's working with other professionals. And we'll talk about who those professionals are depending on um, your, your case and your age at our course. But, um, but certainly um, I wanted to make sure that we don't forget the breastfeeding dyad as an important thing, um, as an important uh, inclusion in our considerations. We see so many families, you know, those practitioners, we see families across the lifespan and so we have a really um, privileged opportunity to identify and assist them um, with, a prevention, with prevention in mind. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm thankful that um, I'll get a chance to tag on to Sandy's course and um, I've learned a lot from her and we exchange a lot of ideas and I hope that uh, many people will consider coming. Oh, and one more thing, in aid of the fact that early diagnosis is so critical, um, we've discussed amongst us to provide lactation consultants and, um, and midwives um, an opportunity to, to attend the Tongue Tai Day at a reduced rate. And so when you log on to the website, there'll be limited seats for those professionals to make sure that we give these babies the best chance to establish oral function and oral, good oral postures from early life so that we don't end up with those issues later in life. So thank you. Thanks very much, Martin. Really appreciate your time. Um, so yeah, I, we've set up a link, as Dr. Jones was just saying, we've set up a link on coolsoninaustralia.com for those lactation consultants and midwives to uh, be able to get that reduced rate for the for the one day course. So just to be clear, Sandra's foundation in oral myology course will be Thursday 14th, Friday 15th, Saturday 16th, and then Dr. Marjon Jones is coming in on the Sunday the 17th, and we'll be doing a one day uh, presentation on on tongue restriction tongue and lip restriction. Um, let's just have a go over and we'll see if anyone's, other than having a fuzzy screen, if anyone's got a question or comment. Not yet. <laughs> I've, got, I've, got a, I've got a pretty interesting one because funny enough, before we um, came on, there was a friend of ours who came around and, and um, they have a little baby. I don't know how old he is now, maybe three months old and he was having a terrible time, he was not feeding well, he was being diagnosed with oral thrush and actually Marjan, I talked to you about him and you said get get him to the lactation consultant, get him checked out and actually he had his he had his tongue, he had his phrenectomy done and it was slow to start with, I saw him about a week after and he was still sort of a bit bothered about it and kind of sticking his tongue out and he, he wasn't you know, we've, I've kind of heard about they have the surgery done and then boom, they're latching on and they're going fine. He wasn't quite like that a week later, but he was just here, which was probably four weeks later. I think she's just finished doing her therapy with him. Uh, he was drinking like crazy. <laughs> he was amazing. He was going for it. He was alert. Is, is, that, is that an atypical thing that they take a long time to, to adapt or, or, or would that, or would you see it? Is it mostly instant? Are you speaking to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, both of you really, but maybe if you start, Dr. Jones, then we can Sandy can make a comment too. Okay, sure. Um, that's a really good good thing to to raise because no two people are the same. Um, for us to have a very um, um, a fixed point of oh, this is how fast it will resolve is very um, is very myopic. We need to recognize that it, each individual has their own um, issues and will take their own time. In my experience, if they're older, it takes a little bit longer. Any habit is harder to to shift. You know, we're, we're not just talking about tongue function. We're talking about reestablishment of oral postures and breathing and swallowing patterns. And so it's 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 it can be more complex. Um, generally, with breastfeeding, with with many children also, they uh, they it's instant and they they get the symptoms are immediately relieved. But it does take time to make sure that any set dysfunctions, which can be from baby, baby, babies can have it and toddlers can have it or children can have it, dysfunctions need time. You need to unprogram before you reprogram, both in your brain and in your muscles. And so it's important to not lose heart if the results don't come immediately. With the right therapies on side, I think that it, things will go right. But you just need to recognize that um, you need to employ the right therapist to understand mouth dysfunctions to accompany these families through the therapy process. I think that's a great point. Sandy, do you have any comment on that one? One thing that um, I'm seeing so much of here is that the mother is being blamed for a lot of this. And I sort of thought that was being... Um, becoming historical and not happening now, but I'm still seeing it. It seems that a lot of the doctors in particular are do not, they just don't seem to see the value in the breastfeeding um, of these young infants and, you know, the hospitals as well. They're eager to get those people out they're uh, pushing them along with a big carton of formula and the bottles and things. So I think mothers are feeling a lot like their um, nervousness and frustration over the fact that their infants can't nurse should just be put aside. Just give them the bottle and forget about it. And then we're getting these kiddos at five, four, five, six, and seven who've kind of been into that scenario and they have speech patterns that are just awful and facial development patterns the same and um, certainly then tooth patterns and I'm seeing so many of these kiddos with posterior caries because all of this has been sort of pushed aside so I think Dr. Jones is absolutely correct on saying you know, we've got to be educators. We've got to be out there. We've got to band together with more and more of these people who do understand. And we've got to inter-refer here so that we're talking with each other. I know we've just formed a wonderful group here in Denver of chiropractors, osteopaths, dentists, uh, oral myologists, and uh, pediatric dentists so that it more people are beginning to look at this and begin to, to really deem its importance early. How um in how, terms of in terms of in terms of seeing, in terms change, of seeing change how long would it take say for a, a child like you were talking about that child who's got who can't chew on his left side if you see the surgery done and you're working before and after with oromology, which as I understand is pretty critical, how long would you see that change return back to functional? Oh, six to eight weeks. I mean, it's as Mahjan said, it's, um, you know, it's unlearning and then relearning. So it's developing new neural pathways. And if we do that correctly, and if we have good support in the family at home and they follow through, um, it's quite quick. I, I'm seeing those teeth come together 
quite readily in kiddos who are not 16. Even at 16, I see teeth come together, but it takes longer. But certainly in the younger kiddos like this little boy is, I think it's going to make a huge difference. And it, just his whole demeanor is going to change. I'm so excited to start working with this kiddo because the doctors have told these parents that they're just going to have to wait and do surgery. And thank heaven they pushed through and decided to do some early intervention. Hmm. Yeah, amazing. Um, we, we, uh, we need to clone you, Sandy. We need like 1,200 Sandys <laughs> around the globe. Or well, bring it to Australia for good. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's do that. I think Dick, Dick was keen, wasn't he, Sandy? <laughs> um, Can I take Sandy, a moment if there are any questions to yeah, ask Sandy or one, to share something? Are there any questions? Are there any there questions? I don't want to butt in. There is a question, but if you're quick, we can have your comment, or if it's longer, we'll, we'll take wait. the question okay. first. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'd rather take questions first. That's more important. Beautiful. Sandy, you remember Sean from last year's course? I do. <laughs> um, Sean is just wondering if we could describe what to look for in your assessment for anterior and posterior tongue tie, particularly in a newborn. So basically, like we're sort of talking about, I guess we're talking about the management and the treatment and the before and after, but I guess he's really asking, okay, I've got a little baby here and I'm, he's, Sean's an osteopath. For those that don't know Sean, and he's he's potentially doing some cranial work or some alignment, some um, craniosacral rhythm type stuff. What's he looking for? How does he assess this? I think we need like, a comment from both of you. <laughs> I'd like to send that over to Dr. Jones because she's the one who really deals with looking at what needs doing. Certainly. Okay. Um, I want to challenge um, some of the terminology that we've been using um, till now. Um, and, you know, I'm trying myself to sort of begin to shift the way I speak about these tongue restrictions and move from posterior and anterior to submucosal. Um, because I found that when we talk about posterior, especially among professionals, the perceptions that they have is that it's somewhere, and, and patients, they look up what posterior means, back, and they start to think back there, and they're looking around the throat, and, and it, it seems to be causing confusion. So I, I want to begin to shift the way we speak about it in order to understand what we're assessing. The way that I would begin to speak about it, and, I've, and I'm now using this at my practice, is that every tongue restriction is submucosal, underneath the mucosa. However, some have an anterior extension. So this way we know that without a doubt, no matter how something presents, if we can see it to the tip of our tongue, if it's midway underneath the tongue, and if it's, or if it's what we formerly perhaps called posterior ties, they all have a submucosal component. And this links with finding surgeons who understand this and who treat things completely not just a partial release, but a full release. But to answer the question of how to identify this, um, and we speak about this in our course, is to make sure that you get a good history before you even look in the mouth. Get a really good history about how breastfeeding took place, how the child is eating, how, how the child is, um, their, their toilet habits um, and their digestion. Um, and uh, if they snore. So there are lo loads of questions that we'll be sharing that you, you can ask in order to provide a piece of the jigsaw puzzle and each symptom provides a piece. And then when they come to see you, there are things that you'll be looking for in the face. Sandy's alluded to several of them in, term, you know, in the past in courses in how they rest their mouth and how they have their head, um, their posture, their eyes. It, it's, it's quite... Um, just seeing things with, in a new way. Then, after you've got all that, you begin to look in the mouth and um, you have to actually use your hands as well. So it's not just with your eyes, but with your hands you need to do some palpation. And there are some tests you can do in terms of mouth opening 
um, uh, that you can then compare and contrast how wide they open their mouth in various postures to give you an idea because remember we're testing for elevation more than anything. Um, so a lot of people look for protrusion and they say, oh, the kid can poke their tongue out, everything's fine. Or the tongue is moving, everything's fine. And yet if you listen, if you go to history, all the symptoms, especially when coming together, um, are pointing us to the reality, which is a restricted, restrictive tongue. We just need to know how to test it by using our fingers, elevating, um, palpating across. There are several things that can be done. But it, I mean, this is what takes us probably, this is probably a one and a half hour component of Sunday. <laughs> I think the short answer is, Sean, get on a plane. <laughs> Come up to Brisbane on the 17th. We'd love to have you. We know You know we'd love to have you, Sean. <laughs> Sean, I need, I need someone to badger. <laughs> <laughs> I badgered poor Sean at that course just for fun. Someone who is actually joining us. Um, for the course, Sandy, is um, a great chiropractor called Marie Chilton. She's from um, just near me, actually. And she's made a comment as a cranial chiropractor that she's noticed that babies and infants that have poor spinal function and cranial function and poor neurodevelopment, um, sorry, uh, poor neurodevelopment, not pathology, are slower responders to regaining the tongue function. So I guess what I was talking about, little Dusty there, he took a while to, to figure the breastfeeding thing out. He's got it going. So I guess what Marie's saying there is, is does the spine and the cranial function um, and the way that that, how functional that is, influence the feeding after the, after the procedure? Oh, well, I'm sure it does. And, you know, like this poor mom who brought the little infant in with torticollis. She had no idea that this child, who was torqued completely like this, sitting in her little uh, seat, um, and couldn't really hold her head midline at all. This mother had no idea what was going on. And so I would have loved having our chiropractor that we're speaking with um, there just to look. It would be so ideal to have a group practice where all of us are and we could just move from one to the next to see exactly what the symptoms are that would make some sort of sense to hone in on the, the most proper, most beneficial, most expedient treatment. Mm. The thing is that also that the reality is that because we are all work, the world is a small place and our patients, as yours are, sometimes come from very far distances. And so this is where, um, you know, contacts um, such as Sean who are, uh, you know, who are learning or, or any professional, Marie, I mean, we, Marie is somebody that, you know, sees, sees my patients as well. It's so vital to have people that are, um, satellite knowledgeable people that your families can get that accompaniment through because it's when we talk about the release of a tongue tie surgery it is not the be all and end all um, beyond the fact that the surgery must be done completely your surgeon must understand that they need to collaborate and they need to educate the patient to recognize the vital role that for example a lactation consultant plays oral facial mileages plays chiropractor or osteo Someone needs to walk with this patient far beyond just the surgery and sometimes ahead of the patient. You know, they need to prepare the setting before you do the surgery. So um, what you said, Sandy, is a dream to have everybody under the one roof. But um, I guess when we're, we're doing the kind of stuff that we do and the results that we get, the news, um, you know, spreads and people come from far and wide and we need to find... Um, and identify people who get this and educate them and hopefully we'll get some regional people coming to learn what you're talking about so that they can look after patients really well from all over Australia. That's great. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a good point too, Marjan, because, um, you know, it's not just about people coming and doing a course and learning that and then going away and being oral myologists per se. Like they may be osteopaths, they may be chiropractors as speech therapists. We're not saying completely change your practice, but 
um, hey, check this out and, and see how that works and get the understanding of how that works so that they can really support these people that are coming through and, and, and not only in identifying it but be supporting them before and after. So then they might not necessarily become oral myologists but it's definitely worth them coming to learn and see the techniques and understand what it is. And, or, and also, like to be honest, Sandy's courses are a fantastic networking opportunity. We're going to have some 30, 40 people in a room for three or four days. Um, it's a, and, and it's a great way to meet people, to talk about what each other does, to share ideas, to have some heated discussion. It's been known to happen across the room, bang, bang, bang. But also, you know, um, Sandy as a presenter is is she's not a shrinking violet, and so she she will challenge you to uh, to think about or to try or. Um, to 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 step outside your comfort zone in a way in trying some of this stuff. She's actually incredibly special like that. So the courses not only become a networking thing, not only become a knowledge thing, a new kind of uh, way of a, a new set of glasses to, to add to what we've already got, a, um, a filter to look through the window that we've already got, but also the way I look at them, they're a personal development program for three days. Um, I certainly I certainly have found that. Um, Dr. Jones, you attended the last one. Was there any resonance with that, with what I was just saying? Absolutely. You know, um, I think that we can become better practitioners when we attend professional development within our own uh, within our own um, area. You know, dentists attend dental courses and uh, whatever, um, or chiro chiropractors go to chiropractor conferences. But to add the dimension of understanding what other professions do, um, I, find, I have found that I have become a better practitioner as a result of attending chiropractor and oral facial myology courses. It has added depth to the way that I um, perceive the patient and I diagnose the patient. Um, we become almost like physicians, you know, we don't need to be experts in everything, but to know each other's area and to know when we can bring in principles and philosophies from different fields within our practice and then know when to, tr when to refer as well. Um, I think this is a new way of treatment um, where we're not just uh, offering something that's rele relief of a symptom, see you later, bye, but we're looking after the patient as a whole. And to take the, it's the step to attend these sorts of courses beyond our own limited scope of um, our field um, I, I, I can, it resonated with me. I'm, I'm all the richer for, for listening to people like Sandy. Um, I learn from lactation consultants. I learn. I, I'm, I'm just so grateful that, that I'm in touch with so many brilliant people all around, and I can. It's a learning opportunity, and to learn is to be a better practitioner. We're, we're eternal students. <laughs> And, and Sandy also, like one, one of the things I notice whenever I work with people, whether it be breathing or coaching or, or, or even work, obviously working with you, wow, that's been a steep learning curve. But um, for me, I mean, <laughs> in terms of how to run webinars, how to run events, how to <laughs> coordinate lots of different people. And, and, but um, I mean, my, my question is when you're presenting, how much do you learn from all the people that you're teaching? Oh, it's phenomenal. I mean, when I look especially at that last course with osteopaths and chiropractors and certainly people like Dr. Jones there who can share and open some of our eyes to things that perhaps we hadn't thought about, certainly that I had not been exposed to before. It's a huge learning experience for me that certainly has enhanced what I'm able to share with people as I teach now, which just makes it very exciting. And looking at people, as you said, with a different set of glasses, that my eyes have really been open to a lot of things that uh, I certainly didn't get in school the years ago that I was there, nor in going to some of the focused meetings. I love being able to pull from these people the ideas, the questions, the um, thoughtful processing that they do, and it's been very um, enhancing for, for my learning as well. 
Yeah, it's amazing. So if the, any of that resonates with you, if you want to learn more about the tongue, if you want to share, network, grow yourself, um, come along in April. We'd absolutely love to have you. We love doing these courses. It's just one of our favorite things to get there on those three days. And now we've got this bonus day with Dr. Jones as well. So if you're an LC or midwife or you know one and, and they're saying, oh, yeah, well, it's a bit, they're going to get a good rate. It's on the it's on the internet now. Okay, it's on the callsinindustria.com. You can go on there and 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 jump on that course if you're a lactation consultant or midwife. Come and come and spend the day um, learning about this stuff um, and and meeting everyone also that's coming off the back of the three days. And if you do, if you if you are interested in doing the oromology as well, we'll definitely get into that. Um, and 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 check out that check out that course. If there's any issues, anyone can email me, coach C O A C H at the number eight. So coach at eightfoldhealth.com.au. Coach at eightfoldhealth.com.au. Um, it's we we're out of time actually. So, but there is a there is a, a web comment from Marie that I'd I'd really love to close with. Um, which I just think sort of sums up exactly what we're talking about and also it's a really nice punctuation point on the tongue and Marie has put some comments here and she's, her last comment is I love this work as the tongue has been my missing link to optimizing health and function. Um, if you come along to the course you can maybe we can even ask Marie to stand up and share some of her story because I've, I've heard it before but it's an amazing story um, and it was so understanding the tongue and the tongue function was was the link for her to optimizing her health and function. And the last thing she says, Sandy, is bring on the course in April. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. I have to say thank you to Marshawn too because what a lovely time to bring her in and for people to understand her expertise and her um, abilities here to share all of her experience. I'm just, I'm so thrilled. I can hardly wait to be in that course. So I'm looking forward to it. But you also know how much I love Australia. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that too. Yeah. Well, you know how much we love having you down here, Sandy. Margin just said we, we're going to, we were thinking about importing you. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right, bring on April then. Everyone's frothing. Everyone wants to get there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Colin, for all you do. My pleasure. Thanks, Dr. Jones. Thank you. Lovely to spend some time with you and everyone. Okay. See you, everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>